Hi. We're looking at three types of compounds. We've already examined alloys and ionic compounds, so now it's time for molecules. Recall that alloys are blends of metals. Ionic compounds have metal and nonmetal combinations, and that leaves us with molecules, which have to contain only nonmetals. Over here on the left board, I've put up some examples. Hydrogen doesn't exist as just an atom. It exists as two atoms, and they are bonded together. And what we find is this bond is represented with this little line right there. This is going to be a shared electron idea. So electrons are shared, and it works out perfectly because hydrogen has one proton, a positive charge, and this hydrogen has a positive charge. So what could be better than having positive and positive separated by some negative charge? So if we've got positive in the center, positive in the center, and then electrons here, it's a very, very nice arrangement. This is the H2, or hydrogen molecule. Very, very simple. Water turns out to be a bent molecule. We'll explain that in a little while. Water, H2O, has two hydrogens and an oxygen here. We're already seeing some trends. Hydrogen likes to form one bond. Here it is again, forming one bond. And oxygen likes to form two. So let's roll the camera up just a little bit and show the periodic table of the elements above. And I'm going to go through some bonding trends. You can't hold me to these. We break these rules all the time, but this is a nice general trend. These are the officially called noble gases. You can think of them as the old term inert gases because truly, we're not going to be able to do chemistry with them. It takes a very sophisticated system to get these to react. They don't like to form bonds, so I'm going to say they like to form zero bonds. These like to form one. These like to form two, three, and the golden rule in chemistry is carbon likes to form four. Again, one bond, two bonds, three bonds, carbon likes to form four. We'll occasionally break this, but for the most part, you can stick with it. So we've got a water molecule with one bond where it should be two bonds, two bonds to oxygen. Over on the right a little bit, we have the ammonia molecule written up on the board. Ammonia has nitrogen with three bonds. That's consistent with our trend, and then hydrogens with one. Ammonia is rather, well, foul smelling, found in cleaning supplies. As a matter of fact, what they do with ammonia is they take ammonia gas, which is a clear gas, and it certainly isn't odorless. I have a thing of ammonia right in here, and I don't want to open it and smell it. What the manufacturers of ammonia cleaners will do is take some ammonia, and they'll bubble it through water. When they do that, they can sell you a cleaner that's mostly water with some ammonia in there as a cleaning agent. I've got some water in here and a little bit of an indicator. So when it reacts with ammonia, it'll change colors just for demonstration. So I'm going to take the ammonia and I'm going to stick it on top of this apparatus. Now this apparatus has been set up so that what I can do is this. I can give this bulb a squeeze and it'll send a little bit of water up and mix with the ammonia. But you're going to see something quite incredible. The ammonia is going to react with the water and I am not going to squeeze this anymore, yet it continues to happen. I can explain what's happening. The gas is dissolving inside the liquid water. So what's happening is the gas, which are molecules far apart, are getting closer together. It's making a vacuum. So this is sucking up. Water is being sucked up uh, as the gas reacts with it. Since the water is reacting with the ammonia gas and it contains a little indicator, the indicator has the special property of turning pink when it's in contact with the ammonia. We call this the ammonia fountain, and it's a nice little reaction. It is demonstrating that ammonia is reacting with water. Otherwise, we can't explain where did the gas go, so it must have reacted with the water. I'll show that reaction up on the board. We had some ammonia gas, NH3 gas, reacted with some water, H2O, and now the L is for liquid, so G for gas, L for liquid. This reacted to form some ammonium, and we just took a look at ammonium when we looked at our first little list of polyatomics. NH3 and NH4 plus look pretty close. The difference is H plus left water and came over here to form some ammonium. When the water had its H plus taken off of it, what was left behind? OH, O and one of the H's with a negative charge because this H plus came here and left an electron behind. So we have here hydroxide. So we've seen both of these on our little list. We can put these together and call it ammonium hydroxide. 
The AQ is a shorthand notation for aqueous, meaning dissolved in water. So your cleaner is mostly water with some ammonia that's been bubbled through and it acts as a cleaning agent. Nice little demo. Uh, one more to support this trend, and that is carbon is supposed to have four bonds according to our trend. Very simple molecule, methane. Methane is a clear, odorless gas, no smell at all to it, and it's also natural gas. We have a spigot here, and I open it up, and there's some methane coming out. We use it for cooking and heating. Um, you might have a home that's run off of natural gas. It's mostly methane coming out. The smell that you smell is not methane. People know that smell, and they say, I smell gas. We put a little bit of a compound in there that contains sulfur. Uh, it's for safety, so that if you come home and you've had a gas leak, uh, you know that you've got a gas leak and you won't light up a candle or something like that. So molecules involve our nice trend of hydrogen likes one bond, oxygen likes two, ammonia, we have nitrogen with three, carbon and methane with four. I said we'll break some of these rules. Let me show you already. Let me write a molecule SF6 up on the board, which is really quite stable and it's a gas at room temperature and pressure. SF6, sulfur according to our trend should just have two bonds. Zero bonds, one bond, two, but it doesn't. Sulfur is bigger than oxygen and it can have up to six bonds. I'll draw the structure of this. I'm going to show six lines, six bonds coming off of sulfur, and fluorine will adhere to that rule of having one bond. And we have SF6, nice little molecule there. Very nice. Naming of these things. We do need to use prefixes when we name the molecules because the molecules do not operate off of charges. We can't say something like plus six, minus six. It doesn't work that way. You can't attribute minus charges to these nonmetals. So we need a naming system. Let me go ahead and tell you how we do prefixes and naming. Hi. I'd like to talk about molecules, specifically the prefixes and the naming of molecules. Over here on the right side, I made a list of the prefixes that we need to use. Before I tell you how we use them, let's take a look at these little prefixes. One, we don't use uni or something, we use mono. Two, we use di. Three, tri. Four, tetra. Five gets pretty common with pentagon, we use penta. Hexagon for six-sided polygon, we use six, hexa. Seven, we use hepta. Eight, octa. Nine, nona. And then ten, like ten years, decade, we use deca. And the way we use prefixes is we have to tell people how many of these nonmetals are in combination with each other. Let's go back to an example we looked at previously, SF6. We tell people that there's one sulfur present by writing out sulfur. We typically do not use the prefix mono with the first entry here. So we're not going to say monosulfur. We'll just go ahead and say, ah, it's sulfur. You do that in math quite often. You don't tell people 1x is equal to 4. You just say x is equal to 4. It's not necessary to put the 1. Well, we don't use the prefix 1 in front of the first one that we're using. So sulfur. But now we have to tell people that there are six fluorides. So we're going to say sulfur hexafluoride. Sulfur hexafluoride. The reason we need to do this is because there might be another combination with sulfur and fluorine. Very, very quick sample of this is we're familiar with CO2 carbon dioxide, known as dry ice when it's in the solid phase, there is also CO. And both of these exist, and we, you know, we're not sure why. It's like, well, what's going on? We can't play the charge game. It has to do with the sharing of electrons. Carbon dioxide up on the top is carbon. And we don't say monocarbon. We just say it's carbon. It's the first entry. Then we have to tell people those two oxygens. Well, we tell people die for two. And so we make the entry oxide for the second nonmetal. Oxygen becomes oxide. Now for CO, what we have to do is tell people this is carbon monoxide. You can file this under who would have guessed that both of these exist, but they do. And we have to tell people this isn't carbon monoxide, it's carbon dioxide. This is carbon monoxide. We just did the naming of molecules. Let me do a demo involving some phosphorus. Elemental phosphorus can come as P4 units. It's really fascinating how these are set up. Looks like a triangular-based pyramid. So we have P4 units here. And it's rather unstable because in the presence of oxygen, these bonds will open up. They're, they're, think of them as being rather stressed out, going, wow, we're all held so close. 
So in the presence of oxygen, which I'll do in a moment, these will open up and grab some oxygens. Well, this isn't balanced. And by balanced, it says, hey, we have the correct number of atoms on the left, meaning what we start with is on the right. It's like saying, well, when we do a recipe in the kitchen, if you're going to make like, oh, I don't know, bacon and eggs in the morning, and you start with four eggs, you have to end with four eggs. They might be whole eggs here, and they might be scrambled there, but you can't mysteriously say eggs have disappeared into space. Well, we've got four phosphorus atoms here and four phosphorus atoms there, so that's fine. But we start over here saying, well, oxygen comes in pairs. We need to account for the correct number of oxygens that will form this compound. Now, we need 10 oxygens, as it turns out. And so how many of these O2 units do we need? We need five. And now it's correctly balanced because it's saying five pairs of oxygen will give us 10 oxygens in P4O10. For naming, this is phosphorus. This is the oxygen molecule. And this is tetraphosphorus tetra for four, tetraphosphorus, decoxide. Well, let me show you this little demonstration. The phosphorus is buried inside a solvent, and that's to protect it from the oxygen in the air. So what I'm going to do is distribute a little bit of this on these filter papers, which are set up on graduated cylinders, and the solvent will evaporate away. As soon as the solvent evaporates away, the phosphorus will be exposed to the oxygen in the air and we'll get ourselves a nice little reaction. So we've got phosphorus units that have been placed on top of the paper and they're covered with the solvent. But the solvent evaporates and only takes about half a minute more. And then oxygen can get to this and then the reaction will proceed. These are little filter papers. These are graduated cylinders, cylinders that we can put some solutions into. And they're graduated, they're marked so we know how many milliliters. Like right here, it looks like that's 40 milliliters right there. This one's a little bit smaller. This is a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder. That looks to be about a 250. Maybe we'll get some uh, reaction here in the next couple of seconds. I see some smoke. Sounds like a dog barking. I did that one first, so here comes the little one. Higher pitched, maybe like a lab and a little schnauzer or something. Oh, hi. We just got finished using prefixes with molecules. When we have uh, molecules that are significantly bigger and usually contain more than two of the elements, we usually come up with some common names. Sucrose is also known as table sugar. And sucrose is a historical name here. And it has 12 carbon atoms. And then it has 11 units of water. What I mean by that, it is, has 11 oxygens. And since water is H2O, we have twice as many hydrogens as oxygen. What I'm going to do is a little demonstration. I'm going to show that we're going to take this molecule that contains the nonmetals, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And I'm going to chop up all the bonds. I'm going to leave some carbon behind. And hopefully, I'll have some oxygen, some hydrogen, and these can also get together as water. I'll have some water leave. Now to do that, I need something pretty strong. It's like, how am I going to tear the sugar, the sucrose apart? I'm going to add some sulfuric acid. So I'm adding 35 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid. And I'll do just a little bit of mixing here to get things started. Get this all wiped off here. Looks pretty good. So the sucrose is starting to change color. We're having chemical reaction. It's starting to turn black. The carbon that's left behind will be black. Now carbon that's in its pure phase can be carbon graphite, as we call it. That's like uh, just like coal. And um, it's also ground up and used as graphite lubricant for locks and machinery. It's being formed, and some water and some uh, carbon dioxide might be given off if we're losing some of the carbon and some hydrogen and oxygen gases. But the reaction hasn't come to completion yet. It's giving off some heat. If I go ahead and touch it, I go, that's really warm. And so heat's being generated, and it's going to make the reaction go faster here towards the end. Now watch what's going to happen here. There go the gases at a high rate. You can see the smoke being given off there. As a matter of fact, I can swing over this little snorkel and help get rid of these fumes so that they go outside rather than stay inside the room for a bit. And we have ourselves carbon graphite. Now, it's not growing. We're not making something from the air. 
it's very porous. There are openings inside this like a sponge. You can imagine that this is probably how we make things like uh, styrofoam and foam rubber. It's like how do we make sponge like substances? We have them manufactured in what we call a gas evolving reaction. So gases are given off and they're going through this material that's making it porous. And it does, it smells like caramel in here from the uh, hot sugar, the inverted sugar, the caramelized sugar. So a little destructive demonstration tearing sucrose into its components and we're left with uh, pure carbon.